Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're pleased to welcome Jack Livings in support of the Blizzard Party in conversation with Leslie Tenorio this evening. Uh, first, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed this evening, but you might want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase the Blizzard, the Blizzard Party, uh, excuse me, from Literati. Uh, if you're watching us later on YouTube, of course, there's always links in the description right below me to purchase books. Uh, we ship anywhere in the United States. Um, and if you're watching live, of course, you can submit questions using the Q&A portion of the Q&A feature of the, of the webinar available to you at any time at the bottom of your screen. And I'll read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. Whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author, and our In Conversation partner. Jack Livings is the author of The Dog, which was awarded the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize, the Rome Prize for Literature, and was included on the best book of the year list by the Times Literary Supplement and the New York Times. His short stories have appeared in Best American Short Stories and have been awarded two Pushcart Prizes. The Blizzard Party is his first novel. He lives in New York with his family. And Leslie Tenorio is the author of the novel, The Son of Good Fortune in the story collection, Monstrous, named a book of the year by the San Francisco Chronicle. He is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Whiting Award, a Stegner Fellowship, and the Rome Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, as well as residencies from McDowell Colony, Yaddo, and the Boliasco Foundation. His stories have appeared in Atlantic, Zotrope, All Story, and Plowshares, have been adapted to the stage by the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco and the Mayu Theater in New York City. He is a professor at St. Mary's College of California. They can't hear you, but they can sense you through the power of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Jack Livings and Leslie Tenorio into your living rooms. Hey, everybody out there. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Literati Bookstore in Ann Arbor for hosting. Um, I Please support this bookstore if you are considering picking up a copy of this amazing book, and I strongly suggest that you do. Um, I'm super excited to, to be doing this, this event in particular. Um, about just over 20 years ago uh, is when I met Jack. Um, I was five and he was three, give, give or take some decades. Um, and one of the first things he ever said to me was, I want to buy you a gin and tonic. Um, and that's, that's very meaningful to me. So uh, I thought, you know, if this guy wants to buy me a drink, I, I think I can carpool with him for a couple of years on the way to workshop and, and be in workshop with him. Um, and being in class and seeing his work, which was amazing even then, um, it's just been really thrilling to see the work progress and to see the stories and to see the books, the dog, this incredible collection, uh, which won all those awards, uh, as John had mentioned. Um, and now to see the Blizzard Party out in the world um, is inspiring and, and exciting. And all the success is so well deserved. Um, I'm going to let Jack read for a little bit. But before I do, I just want to um, share some reviews of the Blizzard Party. Uh, I got a star review from Publishers Weekly. They called it a brilliant debut novel. The San Francisco Chronicle said it feels like a life's work and it's thrillingly original. And the New York Times said it is a raucously um, innovative take of loss and erasure told with an authorial assurance uncommon in a first novel. Uh, and that is absolutely true. Um, I'm really excited and, and, and happy to be uh, hosting Jack. So Jack, you want to read a bit and then we'll have a conversation. Why don't we just stop? That's that's great. We're done. <laughs> Thank just you, have David. a tonic. Maybe we should just have this a is, Yeah, I mean, this is this is really great, Leslie. I, Leslie and I have been friends for a long time, and since we were very small children, 
as he mentioned. Um, and so this is, this is really nice. Um, you might also, if you're, if you're thinking about picking up my book, um, you might want to check out his oeuvre, monstrous um, collection of short stories that won many, many awards. And, and is it, Leslie, is it coming out in paperback when, in April? Or is it? Mon uh, monstrous is out in, it's in paperback. Monstrous is already paperback. The Son of Good Fortune, his novel, which is astonishing, is coming out in paperback in April, right? I think in May. In May, okay. Um, yeah, it's nice to be here with you. Um, and John, thank you. Uh, and Literati, a huge thanks to you. Um, these bookstores are essential to, to books that are um, maybe slightly less accessible than, than the average uh, novel. Um, things, things like what I'm trying to do. So um, thank you very, it, it, it's a huge honor to, to be on here and with auspices of literati. Um, so I, I wrote this book called The Blizzard Party and, and it's, uh, it's narrated by a woman named Hazel Saltwater who grew up in New York City. Um, her father was a novelist and he took uh, events from her life and turned them into a, a novel that, that made uh, her famous and made him even more famous than he already was. He was relatively well known at that point. Um, and the blizzard party that I hold in my hands here is novel is uh, Hazel's attempt to retell the story of what happened uh, on February 6, 1978 during a blizzard in New York City um, in her own words. Um, the, the impetus for her doing this, it turns out, is um, that her husband, who she lost uh, in the North Tower uh, on 9-11, um, his remains have been 15 years later recovered. Um, and when your remains are recovered 15 years later, that means they found a shard. So that's what she got. And um, it, it sort of set her off and running. And so there's, there are sections of the book that deal with her um, trying to deal with uh, the grief of, of losing her husband, who she can't quite admit uh, before she has his remains. Uh, she can't quite admit that he's actually gone. And uh, a friend of hers who also lost her husband on 9-11 uh, recommends to Hazel that she try this new outfit that she found um, it's a company that will create scenarios that allow you to, to relive uh, experiences that other people have been through or something completely new that you've never been through that you just want to try yourself. Um, and they call them complications. And so the section I'm going to read is about uh, Hazel's very first complication. On the appointed day, they sent a car to deliver me to the compound upstate on the Wallkill River. They layered me in Nomex, full hood, breathing apparatus, 40 pounds of shielding, ushered me onto the office floor where I stood among my husband's colleagues, professional stuntmen and women I now know, variously hammering at their keyboards or sucking on coffee cups with a foot on the file cabinet or watching the news. And there was this one guy, I had a phone to his ear nodding, scribbling on a pad, and it was he who got my attention because I wanted to know what he was writing. Gibberish, doodling, interlocking benzene rings, or had he so committed himself to the role that he had collected research on deals the firm would have been tracking that morning and was jotting from memory so that I, the participant, might in some way benefit from his method approach? I stood against the back wall in my green EOD suit, peering out through the acrylic visor at the scenery, and there above the windows, Eden was right, what a view, where the LED clocks for London, Singapore, Tokyo, Frankfurt, Buenos Aires, Shanghai, Milan, New York, and it was 8.42 by my request. And when I said, ready, into the hands free, the colons on the LEDs began to flash and I prepared to die. 
had spent a month under the supervision of a psychologist, but when it was showtime, I didn't feel like I was Vic or myself or an all seeing eyeball. I felt like I was a stranger to us both, someone who paid an outrageous sum of money to participate in an outrageous stunt in the name of distraction. I felt crass and dishonest and utterly American. I had a long four minutes to consider the implications of what I'd undertaken, the fiction I was creating, the familiar sense of life that had removed from life. I had time to consider the presence of Albert Caldwell within me. Yes, still there, always there, either directing me toward or away from the truth, from his frozen little cave. I couldn't tell which. I could never know my existence being a dictatorship of ignorance. And at the mark, the windows erupted and fire stormed through the space a rolling, rippling flood of plasma, incinerating carpet and paper, carbonizing the ceiling tiles, roaring like river rapids, exerting an unexpected force, a physical force. What did I expect it? Seaweed lapping at my legs, lambs licking at lilacs, tongues of flame and all that? Certainly not this godlike presence crushing me from all sides, reducing, suffocating, combusting within me. The flaming analysts had all dropped safely into the subspace through trap doors, and when the ceiling collapsed, my puckering throat sucked at the deoxygenated atmosphere, even though the EOD suit had been reinforced with a carbon fiber cage so that I was wearing, in essence, a protective refrigerator, and the O2 was flowing normally. The crushing panic was only my neurons hurtling along ahead of the physical sensation, playing the odds. And as I lay pinned beneath the rubble, panting, stinging sweat, searing my lips, the screech of steel girders shearing from their mounts piped into my headset, rebar screaming as it nodded and broke. I recall my training and I opened my eyes so that I might take in the same darkness as Vic, had he been there. Had he been there and had he survived the initial impact. A tiny flame danced around in a little pocket of rubble before my eyes gobbling up oxygen that had Vic been trapped there could have sustained him for just a few seconds more. A bright red combustion thread crawled across a wafer of ceiling tile wedged against my helmet. Soon that light too flickered and dimmed and died. The rubble shifted now and then and I watched and breathed and listened. Oh man, that's so good. So oh, good. I mean, just sentence to sentence, word to word. I mean, that's just that that writing is, is exemplary in the level of detail, the vividness, and then you throw in lines that almost transcend the actual moment. I felt crass, dishonest, utterly American. It's such a great passage. Could you talk just a little bit about how you? arrive at a moment like that? I mean, there's so much detail, it's so concrete, yet you're also making statements about the character, but it, it does seem like you're making larger statements as well, like that, like that line, you know, I felt utterly American. What's, what's the work behind that particular passage you just read? Wow, I mean, thanks for saying nice things about it. Um, God, what a good question. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you get to any point that's a final draft, except by just grinding, grinding, grinding away at it for you know years and years. I mean, I, I think I think there's that point at which you get the, the the character's voice. I mean, especially with the first person narrator, the voice becomes natural to you, and you understand without having to guide it where it wants to go. And Hazel is a smart person, um, and. I, you know, it's funny, I, it, Toby Wolf, um, who Leslie and I both studied with um, when we were very young, like 12 and 13, um, made the point once that he, he didn't think he could ever write a narrator who was smarter than he was, um, which I think has its own philosophy. And, and that's a very Toby-esque philosophy. Um, and, and Toby's very humble about his own work. I, I did so much research and and went in so many went down so many wormholes to try to inform Hazel's character that I'm pretty sure she's smarter than I am. And 
And I think, you know, what she's capable of doing in a moment like that is not something that anyone I've, I've ever necessarily met. I certainly couldn't do it um, in, in this reconstruction of my, my husband's death. I don't think I could leap out. Um, but that's, I mean, it's also, I mean, I, I, that's a, a little bit of a literary device, isn't it? You know, I mean, you, you're pretty good at that too, I think. I think we, we get a feel for where the, where it's time to be interior, where it's time to describe what's right in front and, and then also when to, it's not contextualization, but it's, it, it really does all come back around the character, right? It's about this character's inner churn and, and I think that's genuinely how she felt at the moment. I think, you know, this, this um, she was an utterly American person. And, and beneath that, maybe above that, she was utterly a New Yorker, <laughs> you know. I like that you say that you, maybe Hazel might even be smarter than you, because I, I, I think we, like, like, you know, you're quoting you know, Tobias Wolf there, you know, rarely could could our characters be smarter than me. As, as writers, we need to be smarter than our characters. But I like this idea that maybe we can come up with a narrator who is smarter than us in ways and we kind of follow them. Maybe it sort of preserves a little bit of mystery behind the process. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe, if, if maybe that, I'm hoping this uh, segues very seamlessly into my next question. Um, maybe having Hazel as your guide was a way of figuring out the story. When I've been describing your book to friends and to, and to other readers, I keep using the word feat, F-E-A-T, because to me, it is a feat. I can't, I can't fathom how to write a book like this. It's so big, but still cohesive, um, that I wonder, I've been, I, I wanna know what was like the actual physical process of writing a book like that. And what I mean by that is when I imagine you writing this, I imagine you <laughs> standing at a white wall with like maps and charts and push pins connecting them with string, like in a crime solving montage in a procedural, you know, with a Chinese takeout you're eating at 3 a.m. I just imagine all that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, and like just physically, I know this sounds weird, but physically, how do you write a book yeah. this big? that way that you just described. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a lot of charting on walls. I, I'm, I wound up outlining it and re-outlining it, re-outlining it, especially after I got into the halfway point because I couldn't keep track of what was happening um, chronologically because I didn't write it in linear fashion. I wrote it jumping around from character to character and, and time to time. And I mean, just, I, I presume most people haven't, read it and it's it goes 1978 to about 2016 uh, 17 Poland 1945 Princeton University 48 49 uh, 46 47 so it's it's all over the place and a lot of people's lives are intersecting and had tons of charts um, with birth and, and death. And then I had a little cemetery in my notebook for every, every character. Um, the family trees were there. Um, I had all of the <laughs> stuff that's, that didn't even make it into the book, but, but uh, there's a lot in there uh, towards the end about the um, uh, German munitions company Krupp and, and tracing the way money flowed post-World War II from, uh, through this one banker, this one Swiss banker who after the Nazis all fled to you know, South America, wherever they went, he was still funneling money um, into the PLO and to eventually into Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda plays a role um, obviously in a book about 9-11. So the more research I did, the more charts I had to deal with and stuff. And it was, it had, um, the, the book had three separate focuses over the period that, that I was writing it. I mean, going back, it started, I started working on it 10 years ago. 
um, it was initially about the writer himself, Erwin Saltwater. I had, he, he came to me as a character first. I wrote it for a long time about him. And then it shifted over to this old man, Albert Caldwell, whose name popped up in that passage I read um, and his attempt to uh, commit suicide on the night of this storm. And it was still all over the place. And it wasn't until Hazel showed up as a first person narrator um, and she, she backed into it because I had it written in third person. And I said, oh, it'll be okay. I'll just switch to first person for a little while. And everybody would be cool with that, right? Like, you know, no one would be confused or anything. And, and she, that was her. And once I had that voice and the frame of, oh, she's rewriting the book about her life. That's, that's what ties all these people together. Um, and, and she was, she was the linchpin. Everybody, everything flows through Hazel. And it took me years to figure that out. So, I mean, it's just a, you know how it is. I mean, it's, I know that there are people who outline books from before they start. Um, and those are probably really good books. And that's not how this one went. It just felt like trains crashing into each other and the craters, you know, opening up and swallowing things for years and years and years. Um, and, but and then towards the end, the charts really got important. And I did have a white wall with the, uh, <laughs> you know, every, everybody's life story on it. I don't know that it helped though. I feel like that stuff is so useful. It, it's mainly useful as a, I mean, as a reference point, it can be useful, but I feel like the idea of taking a novel and putting it into a, a single visual space is really important. It's, you know, it's kind of the, the idea that you can contain this thing and control it, even though you can't. It's you're psyching yourself into the idea of, okay, I'm on top of this. Right. I can ride this way 50 feet. I can do it. You can't, but it tr you can trick yourself into thinking that you can. Um, in the same way that using index cards, I think, can make things easier because the blank page, the size of the blank page is reduced. So it's easier to fill up the card and, oh, okay, I'm doing all right, you know. But yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm, that's a great question. I'm fascinated by the physicality of writing and yeah. the physicality of calming your body enough to concentrate and, and find that river inside yourself that you have to dip, dip into to actually do good work. So it's, it's kind of my jam. Well, I think the white wall paid off because this, I mean, this, this book comes together. However you did it, it comes together, you know, utterly satisfyingly. Um, so keep that wall. It's also, I think, helpful to, you know, you're looking at the screen or the notebook, whatever, for X number of hours a day to, to, to feel like you're still focused on that work, but you're literally at a wall for an hour or so. I think it'd be really helpful. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I think, I think paper is enormously helpful too. I mean, I, I know that there are a lot of like great programs that you can use to outline things, but there's something about the tactile quality of paper to me with like a lead pencil on it that, it, it one thing it does for me is it slows me down like my I, I have to slow down and think at a certain speed because I can type just a little bit faster than I can handwrite stuff and typing stuff looks so final to me it's like it's hard for me to move forward because it looks like it's got to be perfect so I can't get off the first sentence so here I am writing the first sentence of the novel for four years because I can't get it right you know it's like let's go over to the notebook and try and stuff. Yeah, I'm a fan of the notebook too. Legal yeah, pen. I mean, how do you do it? Do you do you work on paper first or? Uh, it depends on what I'm writing. I mean, I haven't written very much. It depends on what I'm writing. At a certain point, I definitely use legal pads. Like, you know, even if it means, because I like, you know, I like to go to coffee shops or bars sometimes to just try to pretend I'm writing. And so having the notebook really helps. So. <laughs> Legal pads and white walls. That's that's Erin's tip for the day. <laughs> um, you know, you you mentioned um, all the places and time eras, time eras, eras that the book spans. Um, much of this book, though, is really anchored in in the Blizzard Party uh, or during the Blizzard of '78. And you do a remarkable job of giving us the world of New York City at that time. 
But you know, as a writer, especially for a book that's character driven, your ultimate responsibility is to your characters. How do you go about researching or, or maybe preparing to render characters whose attitudes, choices, judgments are anchored by their time? Hmm. Like, you know, what is it to be a human being in 1978 New York City? How do you get, because that psychology is different from today's psychology. How do you do that? How do you research? Maybe you don't research, but what's that process like? So yeah. I was thinking about that after reading the book. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, I think some of it you just have to take a flyer on and 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 hope that you're getting it getting it right. I, you know, I mean, for me, gender politics were a big a big thing that were in the forefront of my mind when I was writing it because men were men and Norman Mailer was Norman Mailer and and the predominant attitudes were very different. And Hazel's mother. Um, is a painter and and she you know has a conversation with a guy in the book about a painting and he just uh lectures at her for she she's actually the second time she's been lectured to at the party that night and i don't know that that's all that different than it is today um but the 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 i think you have to you have to, I mean, that's where I, I presume that's, that's where what Wolf is talking about comes in. It's like, you're only so smart as what you know about your characters and the time they live in and you read as much as you can. And I've certainly read, you know, plenty of Philip Roth and, and you know, that perspective on the seventies um, is very specific and I think predominant in literature at the time. Um, and I sort of took my cues from there in a lot of ways. Um, and I think you have to worry, I mean, you worry over every word and every, every line. And then at the same time, like I said, I think you just have to hold your breath and hope that, that you know, I mean, it, it, the, the goal of a novel is not to be uh, accurate, but to be, uh, a representation of a of a dream, in a way, and you know, I I think I I I am more. Let's say I'm on the on the more journalistic end of the spectrum when it comes to writing fiction. I, I do worry about getting details right, um, but there's always the safety net of saying this is fiction, and you know. And, and also, I mean, a human in 1978 is not concerned about things that are that, that different from a human in 1278 or 2078, I would presume. You know, the, the context changes. But we, and, and I mean, just getting that stuff right, like being honest about what people actually want, and how they go about getting it, that I feel like is the main guiding principle. But, you know, and it's also like writing about the 70s is a hell of a lot of fun because, you know, it's, I had such a good time like researching, I did all this research on Iggy Pop and, and the Lust for Life album and how he wound up, you know, how he wrote it with Bowie in Berlin and, you know, they got the, they got the beat from, for the song from the, armed services TV station there, the, play, the dits and bats that they would play, like, dun, 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 like, and then they gave it to Hunt Sales, I think, who was the drummer, and he was like, oh, this is that other song's beat, and they figured it out, but still to this day, people don't know exactly what kind of drum set he used, so I just, I get completely consumed by that kind of thing, and it generates, somehow that generates character to me, and then I did all this research on it, and I felt like I finally had it nailed down, and then, like, some anniversary popped up and the New York Times wrote a piece that was so thoroughly like point by point, exactly all the research I had. I mean, it's not like other people didn't know this stuff, but I was like, oh, why, why didn't I just wait? And I could have just cribbed it all from the Times. But I, that stuff to me, like doing deep research um, generates excitement about characters, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. You know? 
I feel like um, I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry. No, no, this is great. Um, so, uh, as John mentioned, um, the dog, which is your first book, did very, very well. I mean, it won all these awards, and it's an amazing book. Um, that was a collection of stories. This is your first novel. Um, could you talk about why stories are better than novels and why novels are better than stories? <laughs> I thought that was all you're going to say, because stories are better than novels. Everybody knows that. And poems are better than stories. Um, <laughs> and paintings are better than everything. No, I, uh, stories are better than novels because uh, they're compressed and the, the requirements for writing a good story are, you know, there's that old, I, I feel like ever since I was very young, I've heard that thing, but you, you know, you get no mistakes in a short story. You got one mistake in a novel, said the enforcer or whoever. It's like, okay, you know, I, I think you can be baggy in a novel. Certainly, um, I, I went the discursive route in this novel in a way that I'm, I don't think um, works in a short story so much. I, I think a short story, you, you set it up, you run it and shut it down in a way. I mean, it doesn't have to be that fast, but it's um, the, the value of a short story lies in its ability to, to deliver a, a gut punch sometimes. Um, and a novel, it, it, I mean, it does have something to do with time. I mean, it has, it has to do with how much time you spend with characters and and dreaming with them and, and meeting the novel halfway. And I think it becomes a part of you in a different way than a short story. Um, and my experience is that, that what resonates with me after I finish a novel is not the ending. It's always short, short story endings always, like good ones, are always what blow me down. And I, I think about the endings and get weepy about like, oh my God, that, that line at the end, just, I mean, like, and you have written a number of those, frankly, like your short stories do that. And the, you know, I mean, just compare and contrast, like your novel, the, the, the scope of it and what it does to me after the fact, it's like it, it keeps tumbling in a way that a short story feels set. Short story does this thing, and a novel because I think and there's just more a little more room for complexity, um, and and novels certainly pay you back in a different way when you read them a second time too, because you you get resonances that can completely change the reading of of the novel, whereas I'm, I'm not sure I've ever had that happen to a story. I've had, you know, I'm thinking about like rereading Alice Munro or somebody like that. The story becomes a, a larger beast every time you read it. Um, and it picks up, it, 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 it accretes emotional resonance. Novel, I feel like can operate on your mind that way. Um, too, in a way that, that a story doesn't, though, and it's, it can become a different thing the more times you read it, you know. Um, I like what you say with a novel that you live with the characters, you also dream with the characters. That, mm -hmm. that resonates because, you know, there, you do have the space, I mean, you don't have to do this, but you do have the space to be really, you, you can take the time to be really interior and to just sit inside that character's head that if you're writing a story, you might be a little panicked about that because you're thinking it's 18 pages now, it's 19, now it's 20. Right. That, that's the kind of stuff I, that would end up, you know, on the cutting room floor. But with a novel, it can stay. That, yeah. I like that. I'm going to use that in my classes. Okay. Um, this is all crazy. It's as a copywriter now, so I think Literati owns it. You have to send them royalties. I'll send them royalties. Um, Let's see. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask another question. Um, I'll ask another question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so this is my own version of uh, of uh, that you know that game. I think it's called. Pardon the the crassness. Uh, Mary screw and 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 kill. But I have an updated version. It's a little more audience friendly. Um, 
I'm calling it uh, drinks, dinner, and drugs. In your book, which character do you have drinks with? Which character do you have dinner with? And who do you do drugs with? Oh my God. So this is a chance to sort of like, you know, talk, you know, talk up your characters. Drinks, there's so many drinks, of them. dinner, and drugs. Okay. Drinks, dinner, and drugs. Oh my God. You have a drink with Albert Caldwell. You have a glass of scotch with Albert Caldwell because he's a crusty old son of a bitch. And he'll sit there and tell you how it is, but you'll come away feeling like maybe you've learned something about the law or something, but that's a drink. I think I want to have dinner with, with Hazel. I, I think she would be, uh, she'd be interesting to have. I, I, what I think is interesting about her is that she's not someone who would sit down and start talking and talk a novel at you. She would only write a novel. She would listen and probe and she would know things that you can't believe she knows. Um, I think that that's a good dinner companion. And the, to do drugs with, um, I mean, Tanawat's got the best, best drugs. Like Hiwat's got, a, got a, a whole cache of marijuana up in the apartment. He sets up the hookah at the party in the beginning. And like, he's got the connections. Like, I think he, by the end of the book, I think, you know, it's like he has, hangs out in Vegas half the time. And, you know, he's in LA and I think he's, I think he's got good drugs. So. <laughs> and he's a bit of a bit he's a he's a bit of a bit he, he's uh not a huge character he's very important to me because he's a, a pivotal character um but he's a young man who's who's uh, uh an exchange student who, who lives in the building with all these kooky people and winds up at the party and, and uh, his life is it turns out intertwined with Hazel's by the end, so that thing that was better than I, I thought we were gonna. Because you promised me we weren't gonna play that game. I'll ask the other question over text later. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask, just because it's a it's a good follow up, and I was actually thinking yeah. about this. You refer to you use the term bit character, but it's a bit character that meant a lot to you. Yeah. Um, this book has so many characters in it. And to me, they all belong. Like, I didn't feel like, okay, this is some cardboard cutout that could go. What makes, what necessitates a character's presence in a story for you, mm -hmm. however major or minor that character is? I, the, it ha the, the character has to play a role in the, uh, I mean, I guess in the plot, I guess that's what you call it they have to advance the story in some way. Like there's, there's nobody in this book who isn't there for a very specific reason and who doesn't, if you, if you did sit down and chart the novel, every single person who's mentioned has a motivational reason for being there. They, uh, they push the story forward. They, they take somebody out of the scene and something happens because that person is out of the scene. I mean, even the guy who's out on the sidewalk shoveling this around the entire building plays a role in that he gets the doorman out, which allows Vic and Albert to go up to the party in the first place, which sets all of the, it sets everything in motion. And, you know, I, I don't think that's necessary, but that's, I, I kind of have a clockwork vision of how this, book work because it, it goes so many places I wanted it to all lock together and I mean that's the thing it does it, 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 it's been I've seen it described as discursive and and I think people might have said it, it wanders or something like that but it truly if you took the time and you cared to do it everything's there for a reason everything that happens is there for a reason I mean it started out at about 900, 950 pages, and we, we cut, we cut it and cut it and cut it. So there's not a not a lot of meat on the bone uh, mm -hmm. left, even though it's kind of fat. Still, it looks big. It's big boned. It's a big, yeah. bone. <laughs> <laughs> big bone. It's got a good big bone. Yeah. Uh, I, ha I have more questions, but just you know, I also want to acknowledge that we have an audience. And are there any questions from the audience? 
don't have any questions just yet. I do want to remind folks that they can submit their questions using the Q&A feature of the webinar. And I will ask some, I will come back on video to ask some. But Leslie, if you have more questions, yeah. I, I suppose part of our problem is that folks are truly wrapped by the conversation. And so uh, I'm all for letting that continue. Um, but I'll come back on if there are, are some questions from, from folks who are viewing. Great, yeah, feel free to interrupt. So um, you did this awesome interview with Interview Magazine, five things that I think influenced the book. Um, you talked about Iggy Pop, the smiley face, the happy, have a nice day, smiley face, snowflakes. Could you talk about, um, in terms of process, what some of the influences are, or you just, it, just in terms of writing, whether you're writing a story or a novel, obviously you read, you do research, what non-readery, non-writery things do you do that feel part of the process and, and, and really do feed the, 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 the writing and, and just, yeah, the act of writing? Yeah. Um, music, I, I can't listen to music while I'm writing, but listening to music um, will, will push me. And I wrote a lot of music into this book um, that I was listening to uh, at the same time. I mean, it's stuff that I listen to all the time anyway, like Miles Davis. And I don't know if I mentioned Coltrane in there, but like there's, there's all this stuff that, you know, I used to, back when we used to carpool when we were two and three years old, going to workshop, um, I listened to a lot of Radiohead, and I used to think that if I could ever write a story that was as layered and complicated as Radiohead, like a Radiohead song, I, I would have gotten it right. And I think, I think that's really, that's the main thing because I mean, writing for me, everything else is about. Like, I, I'm trying to crowd out every other influence because I'm so easily distracted. Yeah. I can, you know, it, like if there's an ant on the wall. 15 feet away, I'd rather watch that than work on the book. So, but um, yeah, all kinds of music and, and especially at the beginning of the process because I get, I can get churned up listening to music and I feel like that's good when, when you need, when you're trying to find the emotional center of, uh, of the graph when you're starting out um, and that helpful sometimes. Speaking of music, um, your father was an opera singer and your, your mother sang as well? She was an opera singer too, yeah. Yeah, they, they met on tour with the New York City Opera. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Lee, I've never heard you sing any opera. In fact, I realized I actually have heard you sing once. Yeah, um, yeah and we, I think I was actually the one driving. You almost did all the driving when we carpooled, but one time I drove and I had the Kenny Rogers Greatest Hits CD in the car and Lucille came up. <laughs> I remember I was driving and at a certain point you're singing along to Lucille, Kenny Rogers, which, which <laughs> made me very happy. And I love that memory. Um, did being the child of, or how does being the child of opera singers, music people, and maybe you already answered this with the last question, but I'm just wondering if, if how does that manifest in, I don't know, in your work or just who you are as a human being moving through the world? I, it, that's, yeah. that's so I mean, it's, it's all, it's, it's the, the book is completely shot through with that stuff. I mean, the, there's a character who's based on my dad, um, who was uh, an opera singer when he was young and things were not going, going well for him. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 at first I apologize for singing in your car because that, I mean, I can't sing, I can't sing very well. It, it, uh, okay. You did it very yeah. softly. It was very yeah. melodic. I bet it was. I was better. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean that's a big. It's a big thing. I mean that's my my entire family is musical. Music was everywhere when I was growing up. Um, my mom taught piano and conducted the choir and sang and there were plays and there was all this stuff and and the expectation was that music would be done that you would do music. And, and um, you have to practice a lot to be good at music. And I was lazy. Um, I'm still kind of lazy. And, and I, I never got good enough to be great on the violin or anything. But I do think like what I inherited from my folks was uh, there's a kind of, um, I feel like rhythm 
is maybe comes a little more naturally to me on the page than other things do. Uh, and, and, and it can be helpful because I can, I probably cheat sometimes and use rhythm uh, and musicality to get myself out of, out of bad thinking in sentences. But, uh, but yeah, it's definitely there. Great. Well, it's, that, it's very obvious in what you read. Uh, there are questions in the yes. Q&A box. There uh, are questions. Great. Uh, I, I, if you want to read them, you're welcome to. I, I, I'm happy to as well. Um, there, the first question, um, uh, a viewer writes, Hazel's a female character. What challenges do you think arise from writing about characters of the opposite sex? Um, that's a great question. I, I think I only asked myself that every day that I was working on the book, like seven years. Um, I don't know why this is. I, 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 I mean, this is a roundabout answer. I'll, I'll maybe get to something more direct via this method. But when I've thought about it, because in The Dog, the story collection that I wrote, the title story focuses very intensely on a female character and what she has to go through with her family. And I like, why, why do I, why am I generating female characters so often? I mean, these are not the only instances, this book and, and the dog. And, you know, I, so my parents were singers. They got a divorce. My mom and I moved from New York to South Carolina in 78. And when I lived in South Carolina, my mom had a huge family but it was my mother, my grandmother, her sisters, and my next door neighbor uh, uh, cousin. My aunt, she was my cousin, but she could have been my aunt um, who raised me. And men were always around, but they were at the periphery of my my upbringing. And, and, and I grew up in in the South South, where on a Sunday I would you know, at the age of seven, be lying underneath somebody's piano listening to the women talk for hours. And so that was, you know, I, I think that's the generative force behind where these voices come from, maybe. It's my mom and, and her sisters. And they were, it was, I mean, it was kind of a matriarchy for better and worse. Um, and, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, the, the question of like what, there's the craft question of how you write someone of the opposite gender. And, and when I would get to points like very specifically, there's one that, that I have mentioned before in this book, I have two daughters and, and a son. But when I started writing this book, my older daughter was about the age Hazel was when the party happens. And I just had scenes in there where Hazel's like talking about her, her school uniform or whatever. And I borrowed intensely from my daughter's experience, like putting on her tights in the morning when she was six and having to get the toe, the, the seam on the toes lined up exactly right here. Otherwise it completely screws up the way the shoe feels and everything's like, and it's just the shoe comes off and like all hell breaks loose. That kind of stuff, I have to borrow. And, and, you know, I mean, God only knows. I'm, I'm sure someone could tell me how many things I've gotten completely wrong. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't know why I do these things. Like, it's, it's a little bit of a high wire act, except that it's fiction. And, and I, don't, I don't necessarily think that we need to be um, uh, hemmed in by... Uh, our limitations. I mean, that there's a little bit of artistic experimentation that's that's going on too. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, and I want to thank everyone who submitted their questions. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but this question is from Tucker, who writes: When you write long fiction focused on a short span of time, do you find yourself discovering more about that imagined moment as you go deeper into your novel's premise? What's your experience of time as you are dwelling, <clears throat> excuse me, as a writer inside the novel's time? Oh man, that's such a good question. I don't know if I don't know if I can if I've got all of it, but 
but the 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 question about time your experience your external experience of time when you're working on the novel and working the novel time boy is that a thing that happens <laughs> my the the my my clock slows down when I'm deep in, deep in something. And I can feel it. I can feel when I get up from work that I'm operating on a different, according to a different chronology even. And this book has a lot to do. I mean, there's stuff in there about geological time. And when I was writing that stuff, it completely, altered the way that I experience, you know, walking around the block outside. If, if I get up, it wears off. But if I get up from the, from the desk and go take a walk around the block, I'm not, I'm not living in the, the hustle of, of New York. It's a completely different thing. And, and I don't want to, I'm going to look because I don't I'm going to focus on the short span of time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, the deeper you go into the premise of the book, I mean, I think that's, that's by necessity. Um, you, you definitely experience, uh, you, you, have a, you have, a, have, a, have a deeper understanding of what you're writing about as you keep going. And if, and if it's not sticking, if it doesn't work, then it's a good signal. Like if you're not having that experience, it's a good signal that maybe you're, you're going down the wrong road and you can back out. And I apologize, I'm not sure I completely answered that, the question that you were asking, but, but thanks, because those were, it's really- I think, I think as well, there's just a curiosity, to, which is a curiosity of mine as well, is, is that, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with, obviously the, the novel spans lots of times, but it's focused on sort of a single, you know, this, a blizzard is, is a specific delineated time. And as you continue to write into it, write into it, write into it, um, it seems like in a sort of um, paradoxical way, it gets bigger and bigger and longer and longer as well, right? Because you, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm going to focus on this specific moment, but that specific moment can become infinite as one, as one writes into it. So I wonder as well if there's a question about how you wrangle those impulses. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, it, it's funny. It reminds me of, a, and maybe you know, John, that the... the is it a Christopher Smart poem about the infinitesimal, uh, the, the flower? And it, it describes going deeper and deeper into the, I mean, you, you can infinitely get smaller. I think time works the same way. Like you can pack an entire lifetime. I mean, think about, you know, I mean, we're talking about Toby Wolf a lot, like Bullet in the Brain, that short story that everybody's read where it's a nanosecond and, you know, his, the whole tumble of his life flows through there. I mean, that's the beauty of fiction, right? You can, you can arrive at, and it's not mimesis necessarily, like, but you can arrive at an altered state of time. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's what a novel should do. I think you should take, you should pour as much as you can into it. I mean, that's, that's the, the other thing about a short story. It's gotta be so focused. Um, it can go so many places, but the focus has to stay tight. The novel, I think you can, like, a, like a, a cake, you can keep dumping stuff into it and it, it will <laughs> get, I'm not, I'm not making much sense about this. Um, I think it's a really good question. Hazel could probably answer it better than me because she's way smarter than I am, but. It, it's a uh, cohesive answer is eluding me. <laughs> well, perhaps there are also answers within the novel itself for those of you who have yet to, to, to read it. Uh, and you can purchase it, of course, at literatibookstore.com. Um, we can ship anywhere in the United States. And if you live in town, you can swing by the store and pick it up curbs, curbside. Jack Livings, Leslie Tenorio, thank you so much for joining us on At Home with Literati. It's a pleasure to have you both virtually in the bookstore. I hope we can have you physically in the bookstore when conditions permit. But until then, uh, we hope you continue to be safe and stay well. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope you stay safe and be well. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Until then, take care, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, John. Thank you, everybody.
Thanks so much.